Welcome back, everyone. Uh, you uh, might still, while I introduce uh, Rick Rule, you might still have a couple of minutes to grab any coffee or dessert that you might want. Uh, but I'll, I'll go ahead with uh, introduce, uh, introducing our next speaker. Uh, the next speaker is Rick Rule. Uh, as I said, everyone who speaks in this seminar is someone I'm a very big fan of. Uh, I have just, uh, I have attended the just concluded Agora conference for the last four years. Uh, three years back, uh, on a certain day, a couple of his speakers were missing. Uh, and so Mr. Rule took their places. Uh, and uh, that, this whole thing reminds me of uh, my uh, watching uh, Bruce Lee and James Bond films as a kid. Uh, whenever I finished, uh, came back home after watching those films, I always felt that I could um, uh, fight with anyone, I could fly in the air, I could defy gravity. Um, <laughs> This time, I heard Mr. Rule for a day, uh, and uh, I, I felt that I could generate uh, uh, any wealth I desired. Um, uh, and, and it was a very similar feeling to what I had um, when I would watch as a kid those films. Uh, now, um, so after watching, after listening to Mr. Rule that day, I came back home uh, uh, feeling that way that I could generate my own freedom. Um, and I also realized that uh, the, the biggest constraint in generating your wealth and freedom is not the state, but you. Um, Mr. Rule is not only one of the most successful investor anywhere, he's a living example of making productive use of, the, of an understanding of the nature of the state, mass psychology, and consequences of those on the society. And what else is a better way to influence others than to be a living, happy icon of your own beliefs? Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome Mr. Rule. Thank you, Jayant. Uh, Jayant was um, too modest or too polite to note that uh, he was a spectacular student. Not only did he decide to become financially independent through his own means, but he achieved it, something he deserves great credit for. <laughs> I'd like to begin, you've seen my title, uh, The Enemy is Between, between Your Ears. Uh, I'd like to give uh, credit to uh, the entity that taught me this. Pogo, a comic strip link character. I have met the enemy, and he is us. I have many more thanks to give, too. I, uh, I like, to think, uh, like to thank Jayant, who conceived of this, and uh, uh, in particular, Rajani, who actually caused it to occur while Jayant was out doing all the things he did. And of course, um, Jack Pugsley, who brought us all together, Jace Nelson, who taught Jack Pugsley, and Doug Casey, who taught me, and who also put on the Ares conferences, which some of you may have attended, which was sort of the uh, philosophical precedent to this. I also need to warn you that the um, high intellectual and philosophical tone of the conference is over. <laughs> you have gone from professor to stockbroker. And what follows me will be no better, I assure you. But, <laughs> Jayant truly has a sense of humor. Uh, he may be proof uh, that mortals and the devils did consort, <laughs> in the sense that he asked a stockbroker to lecture on morality. <laughs> on my honor as a stockbroker, what follows is, we'll leave that alone. But I do have some things to say about capitalism and morality, and as a stockbroker, or more properly, I suspect, as an investor, uh, I've learned a lot about capitalism, uh, and just as a human being, walking around, I have some observations on immorality and morality. Um, observations, by the way, that I uh, seldom impart in regular investment conferences because they're sort of dangerous to impart. I get a sense from hearing the first two speakers that although I will say them in different form than they did, I'm fairly safe in this audience in the context of my own morality. <clears throat> I'd like to start by pointing out something that um, Jace Nelson said in the first speech, and that my wife actually taught me uh, after going through a few Ares conferences, and that is, in the conventional sense, there are no rights. Uh, what most of us believe of as rights are things to which we believe we're entitled, 
that will entire, entire, entitle, pardon me, or cause sacrifice on the part of someone else. There are outcomes which you can deserve through your own efforts, but to the extent that you believe in rights that require the involuntary sacrifice of others, what you have done is you have enslaved them, maybe not in large measure, but in small measure. And we've talked about the state, and we've talked about various forms of enslavement in the context that the assignment, if you will, of legitimacy to a little bit of evil is opening the door to lots and lots and lots of evil. And so I want to begin by saying that there are no rights. The outcomes that you are entitled to are outcomes that you earn. I'd like you to think through the context of my, speak, my speech about what it is that you want for yourself and how you can go about getting it. I have an idea. That's the way I thought, that's the way I think, and that's what I've tried to do, <laughs> albeit imperfectly, with a lot of my life, and that's what I want to talk about. Thank you, Diane. Risk. Part of my title is about risk. Risks are going to happen. I mean, that's just the way life is. Uh, something is going to take you out. Something is going to take out part of your fortune. Something's going to take out your life. And you're going to go through a bunch of challenges in your life. There's a bunch of risks. Um, since they're going to occur, understand that the way that you respond to risk will determine better than anything else your outcome. In some circumstances, if you are capable of perceiving risks more thoroughly than other people, and calculating your response better than other people, your outcome in a competitive society will be better. In other words, you will have benefited from the risk. Since the risk is going to occur, you have a choice. Can you, will you be victimized by the risk, or will you use the risk to better your position? Very, very, very important. The nature of the state, from my point of view, is people attempting to use risk or the perception of risk to better themselves but at the expense of others. I am not going to go into any lengthy defense of the state. For some reason, I don't think that's necessary here. I'd just like to point out to you that in the first instance, there is nobody else that can manage risk for you better than you because there's nobody here that understands what outcome you desire better than you. Similarly, for me to say that I can manage risk for you better than you can manage your own risk presumes in the first instance I know something about your outcome and is at the very, very, very best paternalistically. So I want to talk about maximizing or organizing your life to maximize your own outcomes while minimizing risk. I, um, I, I realize now had my first sort of anti-state moment when I was 16 or 17 years old, and it was profound. I, it's it's uh, interesting that I talk about this in um, Vancouver. When I was 16 or 17, 1968, 1969, it was obvious to me that after high school, a young American male was going to travel. And I thought about my travel options. And the option that was most apparent to me, the choice that was most apparent to me, was on the one hand, Saigon, or Vancouver. <laughs> and I thought about this at some length. While Saigon, you know, was obviously exotic and warm, there was a certain downside to Saigon. You know, people shooting at me and not liking me. And while Vancouver was cold and wet, uh, it seemed to me to be a better outcome. I was profoundly influenced by a very, very, very underappreciated American political thinker who I owe a lot to. Uh, his name was Muhammad Ali. Many of you know him for some of his other skills. I remember to this day watching Muhammad Ali on TV. And this is, at, I'm, this is a joke, but it's not a joke. It was really important to me. Muhammad Ali said, and I'm trying not to paraphrase, I'm trying to quote him exactly. I ain't got no quarrel against no Viet Cong. No Viet Cong never called me nigger. Well, there were some differences between me and Mr. Ali. What he said was as true for me as it was for him. You had all of these other people who were talking about my, my obligation 
to sacrifice a bunch of my life to go across the ocean and kill a bunch of people who I didn't know for some cause that was completely of no interest to me. I had the good sense, I don't know how, to come to Vancouver as opposed to go to Vietnam. And I suspect now I'm retrograde. I mean, how do you do this when you're 18, when you're full of testosterone and you don't have much serotonin? It was probably just luck. But, uh, <laughs> it was the beginnings of um, a series, I guess, of lucky circumstances that caused me to live a life that I'm uh, very, very, very pleased with, and not coincidentally to help other people uh, a lot. And in the context, I guess, of a decision where you recognize that risks are going to occur and the rewards are going to accrue to those who manage risk well. In other words, to recognize that you're self-reliant. Um, a couple other things follow fairly naturally that I think are important for most people to understand. And the truths are really evident, I think, but sometimes we require someone else to point them out to us. Uh, I'm going to refer to material gain the way some economists do and use the term utility. I'm not speaking in the course of what I'm going to talk about in terms of uh, spirituality or philosophy. There were a couple of speakers who came before me that did a pretty good job of that. But you know, material things, utility, the filthy lucre, uh, if you will, are mediums. They're ways to get other things that you want. There was another great American political philosopher, uh, Barry Gordy, who ran Motown Records, who I think was one of the best economists that ever lived. Uh, he wrote wisely, the best things in life are free, but you can give them to the birds and the bees. I want money. Uh, <laughs> And I know at least half the crowd here who are my clients believe in some small measure of that. So I want to talk a bit about utility. And I want to point out, by the way, by utility, I mean material utility. I want to point out that one gains utility by providing utility. If you do something well and you produce a product or a service that other people want or need and they are willing to trade with you the benefit of the utility that they create, you get rich. Society advances by trading and bargaining utility. One gains utility by providing utility and bargaining well the exchanges of your utility for other people's utility. Markets, then, are simply a place where people exchange utility. And it's important to remember that both parties are richer. If I produce apples, more apples than I can eat, and you produce no apples, and I give you an apple, and you give me a dollar, you do it because you want the dollar, or pardon me, I want the dollar, and you want the apple. Both sides go home happy. Markets are a place where people exchange utility, and both parties are better off. And you get rich by providing utility. Now, it's interesting, in the course of the society that we live in, that the rich are more often than not vilified. Uh, the speaker before me, the poetess, I think did a very, very, very good job of pointing out the absurdity of that. There is, I, I just read a um, written article in Foreign Affairs where there was a guy that was talking about the necessity to grind the faces of the rich. Uh, that rich people have an obligation to equalize. That rich people have an obligation to sacrifice, to um, increase the greater common good. Um, the gentleman who was um, speaking in this article was a Jewish guy, and he uh, cited uh, a phrase in Hebrew, which I forget, that was, I guess, some Old Testament injunction. The Muslims have a phrase that I know, zakat. Um, and I am not uh, in any way opposed to voluntary individual charity. My friend Doug Casey will take issue with me later, I'm sure. But I would argue with you that rich people have already paid their debt to society. The fact that they're rich is proof, simple proof. They acquired wealth because they provided so much utility to so many people, and so many people bargained the fruits of their own labor in exchange for the utility created by the rich person, that the rich person's very wealth is demonstration of the debt that society owed them. But the debt has, has been extinguished already because the rich person got 
rich. It's very difficult for some people to face this fact. It's very difficult. You, you look at people vilify, as an example, uh, Bill Gates and uh, Alan, <clears throat> and it may be true that there are some flaws in their software, uh, not flaws that I would notice, I'm incompetent to notice, um, but the fact is I think they were underpaid. I couldn't make their, my living today without Microsoft products. And the idea that Bill Gates did something wrong becoming rich is totally, totally, totally absurd. I think relative to the fact that the, <laughs> the whole world exists on the PC for products like it, uh, suggests that these people were underpaid, not overpaid. And I think a recognition of that on everyone's part is a very, very, very important way that one begins to deal with the risks that you present yourself. I'm going to be talking about mostly about financial risks, of course. And I think that's what, well, <laughs> it's the only thing I can talk about because it's the only thing I understand. You look at the whole set of risks that uh, confront you in the financial world and in any other world. And, um, you know, what would they be? Um, taxes, regulation. Uh, in this country, Harper. In our country, Obama. Uh, the United Nations. Uh, interest rates. It, you can all name them. There's a whole bunch of things out there. Greece, indebtedness. Uh, those things are unfortunate, but it's much more important to consider that they are. You are not going to be able to obviate those risks. They come from a set of circumstances that is infinitely bigger than you. It is true that you're part of it, but you're one six billionth of it or one seven billionth of it or whatever it is that you are. Those risks are out there, and even risks that you weren't part of. Tornadoes, earthquakes, all these kinds of things. Railing against the risk is insane. Quantifying the risks, figuring out how to predict the potential severity of the risks, and thinking through how you're going to deal with the risks. Now that's something that's productive. My friend Doug Casey for years wrote a newsletter opportunity and crisis from that favorite, famous Chinese curse. And it's in fact that set of circumstance, it's in fact that philosophy that I think will enable you to deal the best with the enemy in your own ears, between your ears, pardon me. I, I'm interested in financial markets right now with the fact that people are critically concerned with whether or not Congress is going to raise the debt ceiling. There's substantially more discussion than, about that than the debt. Now think about that. I mean, this is truly insane. People are more concerned about whether these frauds are going to raise the debt ceiling than they are how they're going to replace the debt. In Europe, the big concern in financial cir circles right now is the Greek bailout. Now, it's interesting to me that people are very concerned about how it is that we can cause the Greeks who can't service debt at 150% of GDP, how we can allow them to take that number up to 165% of GDP. Do you think that the debt's going to be more serviceable at 165% of GDP than it was at 150% of GDP? It's understanding the nature of the risk that's important. And when I talk to some of my peers in the financial services business, and they look at the set of circumstances, financial circumstances that face us, any number of the risks that you want to quantify, be it um, debt in the United States, or debt in Europe, or the attitude that people have that financial services regulation somehow makes us safer. But let's deal with more immediate threats. Uh, bankruptcy in Greece is an example, bankruptcy in California. The suggestion that all we have to do is kick the can down the road a little bit and everything is going to be okay that you can make money doing what you've always been doing, grab whatever fee you can right now, and don't worry about happening, what, what's going to happen next week or the week after. Um, I think this is a very, very, very dangerous set of circumstances. And while I don't, how can I say this politely, I'm not cons particularly concerned about the outcome for an organization like Bank of America or Goldman Sachs. Uh, I'm pretty concerned about the impact of the outcome on me and you. I like you more than I like Bank of America and Goldman Sachs. In fact, I work for many of you, and I certainly don't work for them. What interests me 
about the financial services community's response to these risks is it appears to me as though they're figuratively having dinner at a table. And on one chair on the table, there's 10 sticks of dynamite. And there's a common fuse. It's a long fuse, and it's lit. And these people have all been served something delicious, I don't know. Maybe filet mignon and lobster, and you know, maybe some fancy Wall Street wine, Chateau Margaux or something like this. And these guys are having so much fun eating the steak and drinking the wine, they think this is a long fuse. You know, I can eat this steak for a while longer. The correct response, okay, pick up the steak if you want to. Grab the bottle of wine, but get your ass out of the restaurant. There's like 10 sticks of dynamite with a fuse going. And everybody says, yeah, but this is a hell of a steak. And nothing's happened to me so far. Look at the length of the fuse. Pardon my French. Fuck the fuse. Yeah. <laughs> Go, run. Uh, that's what I'm talking about in terms of managing risks. There are some risks out there that are fairly evident, and you might make the right decision, you might make the wrong decision, but if you hang out until that fuse becomes a real problem, the price you pay greatly exceeds the cost of that steak and that bottle of wine. I think I've set the stage. Uh, my job, of course, is to make you sick and then make you well. Uh, most of the speeches, well, the speech will actually accomplish it, I think. One of the ways that I have managed in my life to uh, learn how to avoid risk and, in fact, maximize um, return uh, is, as Jay would suggest, by observation. And one of the most important observations of my life in the context of economics or in the context of the generation and transfer of utility, which is the part of economics that interests me, uh, is summarized by a social scientist, Eduardo Pareto, in Pareto's Law. How many are familiar with that? Most of you. Okay, most of you. Um, Pareto's law is sort of summarized in popular circles as the 80-20 rule. The rule that suggests that 80% of the utility in any given uh, subject or endeavor is accomplished by 20% of the people. It turns out to be statistically accurate. What is also statistically accurate is that 80% of the disutility is accomplished by a different 20% of the people. What becomes more interesting from an investor or speculator's standpoint, and probably from anybody else's standpoint too, because it probably translates into other disciplines, is that if you take the lip, remember these are bells, bell curves, if you take the lips, the 20% that do the 80%, if the subject and population is big enough, you could run the population that constitutes the lip through the same performance dispersal curve, and the lip will conformably align. That's a long-winded way of saying the 20% of the 20 do 80% of the 80, so that 4% of the population generates 60-some-odd percent of the utility, and a different 4% of the population generates 60% of the disutility. A bunch of maximizing utility and minimizing risk involves identifying and hanging out with the good 4% and avoiding, avoiding the bad 4% like the plague. Most of my financial success in life has come from a skill that I have developed over time for figuring out who the good 4% is and running towards them and figuring out who the bad 4% is and avoiding the plague. I like to illustrate this, and I'm not, by the way, arguing that, um, how do I, well, I'll, I'll just claim it after I've made the, uh, made the analogy. Uh, by the way, the 4% will conformably align too. In other words, if you take that 4% and the population is big enough, 20% um, of the 20% of the 20%, that is 8 tenths of 1%, uh, will actually generate, in many, many, many circumstances, 40% of the utility. In the state of California, uh, and this isn't meant to be a good thing, 1% of taxpayers pay 40% of the tax. It sort of demonstrates that to the um, third standard deviation. I'm not suggesting the fact that that 1% that pays 40% of the tax, that that's a good thing. Uh, it's just sort of the way that it uh, conformably aligns. An anecdote which will amuse some of you is that the Speaker of the Legislative Assembly a while ago, Phil Burton, uh, said that the rich had caused the financial crisis and they'd have to pay their fair share. Um, I'm very seldom moved to respond to a politician, but I had my um, assistant find Mr. Burton's email and I emailed him and said, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm delighted to hear you say that the rich in California should pay their fair share. 1% uh, of us pay 40% of the tax. When might I expect my rebate? <laughs> anyway, um, it's
it's important to understand Pareto's law. It's important to gravitate towards the producers. It's important to uh, avoid the detractors. The other thing that's important about Pareto's law is that it isn't always about other people. In order for you to get ahead, what you have to do for yourself, the risk between your own ears that you have to address, is that you have to find some calling in life where you can be one of the 20%, or better yet, one of the 4%. It might be that for you, um, the attainment of economic utility isn't worth the sacrifice. It might be that nothing involved in gaining wealth interests you enough that the maxim maximization of wealth is something that you want to devote yourself to. That's fine. There's other types of utility. But in terms of dealing with the enemy within, finding out what it is you actually want and how you can get it, identifying the risks that stand between you and what you're trying to achieve, and developing a plan to deal with those risks. Of course, a non-collective plan, because I can't help you get where you want unless you lead me to do that, is something that will benefit you uh, for the rest of your life. So Pareto's law is extremely important. You need to gravitate towards producers. You need to avoid detractors. And importantly, most importantly, you have to make yourself one of the producers. You have to find something where you're one of the 20%, or one of the 4%, or one of the 8 tenths of 1%. It's critical that you do that. Most people don't want to do that. Most people have been trained to do something differently. Uh, that uh, poem on equality, I think, demonstrated very, very, very well the commonly placed mis misperception that Pareto's law, because it's not egalitarian, because it's elitist, is somehow bad. It isn't good. It isn't bad. It's simply true. That's what it is. For some people, it's a risk. For some people, they aren't able to be in the best 20 in what they do, what they want to do. Some people may be incapable as a consequence of what Jay might describe as they're having spent too much time in school or read too many books. Uh, they may be incapable of even identifying who the top 20 or the top four are. But it's something that you have to strive to do because it isn't good, it isn't bad, it just is. When we don't want to face this reality because we've been taught that egalitarianism is bad or because we're lazy, um, we default to politics. We default to a system that suggests to us that we have a duty to prevail with regards to our prejudices against other people's freedoms. Um, in the first instance, this isn't true. <laughs> and in the second instance, it is bad. I like when I'm talking politics because I tend to get bitter when I talk about politics. You know, I tend to get angry, and it's not a good way to communicate information. Uh, I like to do a couple of quotes, I think, from Ambrose Bierce. Uh, my favorite, I think, is that uh, politics are under understood in the context of, a, uh, and this is a wonderful quote, elections being advanced auctions of stolen property. The promise of the politician to steal from your neighbor while he defends you is what gets the politician elected. Um, is this good? Of course not. Is it a risk? Of course. As such, you have to organize yourself to minimize, if you can, the impact of elections on you. A better, de a better definition, of course, is politics. The root of the word poly from the Latin for many and tick from the English colloquial for small blood-sucking insect, which I think <laughs> describes the process perfectly. It's a sort of plethora of small blood-sucking insects farming, or farming or armies pardon me, to suck the blood out of their opposition and protect their own blood from the opposition. In the context of politics, and in the context of protecting yourself from politics, I think it's necessary, and I don't like to say this because I try to be a positive person, I think it's necessary to assume the worst. There's occasionally a good outcome. Occasionally, Congress or Parliament does something that while you understand uh, it's immoral, you like it. It's to your benefit. Uh, I like to hike. I realize that the establishment of national parks and their maintenance from the public purse is theft. Um, because it's theft that benefits me, I seem to tolerate it better than other forms of theft. So while it is true that you can be an accidental beneficiary, or if you're particularly competent, particularly immoral, an active beneficiary from this system of theft, you still need to assume the worst in terms of defending yourself. It's important that you assume the worst. Because at least from my point of view, one of the greatest um, 
impediments to your success is collective action. The more utility that you generate in society, uh, the more utility that you gather for, for yourself, the richer you get, the fatter the target you are. The fact is that the better you do for the world and the more benefit you gain, the bigger the target, the more you will be punished. No good deed goes unpunished, and enormous good deeds get punished severely. The tall poppy syndrome is alive and well. So if you do well, only let your own community know. <laughs> Don't let the rest of them know. Doug Casey taught me, I think, that um, we organize better um, spontaneously by interest. He suggests, I think he got this from a, from a um, science fiction book, that we organize ourselves better in files. We organize ourselves better in communities that share our own interests, that share our own perceptions, that share our own needs. And there's no requirement that you operate in one file. I think they would have been called tribes before. But these tribes don't need to be based, based on ethnicity or some accident of geography or anything like that. They're really uh, categories, I think, that are based on uh, interest, self-interest, need. And I don't think there's any, and Doug can correct me perhaps, um, I don't think there's any need to be a member of one file. I think it's perfectly possible to be a member of five files or six files. Because I'm not suggesting that we all operate as individuals. I'm suggesting that we operate as individuals first, but that we operate as part of several communities on an ongoing basis, and that we provide utility to the extent that we can within those communities and draw our utility from them and not act politically. One of the great, great immoralities of government, aside from the fact that it's set up to steal, um, and that's a great problem, is that it provides a false sense of security among people who aren't capable of defending themselves. And this is truly, truly, truly pernicious and ugly. It fosters a belief across a large number of people, people who assuredly probably are not in the top 20 or the top four in any particular discipline, although they might be, that in the first instance, everyone else has an obligation to protect them, false. And in the second instance, that everybody else gives a damn about protecting them, false, and in the third instance that they will be protected by the collective, anyway, false. The example of my decision to come to Canada when I was a kid was based on the premise offered up by the United States government that I had some obligation to protect Americans against the Viet Cong. From what threat? From what threat? The idea that I was going to be able to protect Americans from the Viet Cong was stupid, but the idea that they presented me a threat was stupid. Unfortunately, that sort of presumption has now spread to the point where there's American troops in God knows how many countries, and we're stirring up enough trouble and technology's advanced far enough that this projection of our so-called defense has exposed us to very real threats, things like 9-11. Doug Casey again says, you know, the idea that you go around swatting at hornet's nests in somebody else's backyard invites getting stunned. And this collective sense that we have that in the first instance society is capable of protecting us or should protect us, I think is very, very, very dangerous. I'd like to give you an illustration of this. In the securities business, I'm regulated by something called the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission. I hate to keep deferring to Doug, Doug labeled them correctly, the Swindler's Encouragement Committee. <laughs> what the SEC does is they have this great big bureaucracy, and the great big bureaucracy uh, enforces a series of rules that could probably just barely fit in this room. Um, it's astonishing. I mean, I'm in the business. We have in-house counsel, all this kind of stuff. We don't know the rules. When we ask them a question, they send us back a letter and say, you'll have to get that interpreted by your own lawyer. We don't provide interpretation. I mean, this is truly Kafkaesque. Those of you who have been victimized by Global's um, website, uh, by the imprecise nature of the website, uh, and by the fact that we can't offer up any advice on the website that's useful to you, uh, it isn't because we want to be useless. It's because the Swindler's Encouragement Committee has said to us that websites constitute advertising, and any violation of the SEC statute with regards to advertising um, is criminal and will be um, punished. But they have no guidelines. So what they're telling us is they're going to enforce their advertising guidelines in the absence of guidelines. This is the type of protection that's offered up by the SEC. 
Um, the SEC in Congress, as you know, uh, put in place a bunch of legislation after the Enron collapse, Sarbanes-Oxley. Uh, even that great free market thinker Warren Buffett uh, pointed out that Sarbanes-Oxley costs American business and therefore American shareholders and American ratepayers twice as much money every year as the Enron collapse cost investors. In other words, the cure for Enron costs society twice as much as Enron did every year. I mean, it takes real, real, real skill to institutionalize that type of loss to society. Private business could never accomplish that. It took the government. The truly tragic part of that is that what Enron did was a fraud. And before Sarbanes-Oxley, there were rules on the books against fraud. We didn't need any new rules. I'm not going to argue as to whether we need rules or not. What I'm arguing now is that one of the most pernicious parts of government is this false sense of safety, or the sense of entitlement to safety that's offered up by the idea of government, and why you must fight that in your own mind and in your own community. I had a, um, an actually very bright uh, young team from the SEC come out a couple years to audit me. I found, by the way, that many of these pernicious agencies hire pretty nice people. Um, most of the good ones, of course, figure out what they're doing and leave. Uh, so that over time, the people who stay the longest are the worst. But that notwithstanding, I have a couple of young people from the SEC who are quite nice. And when the SEC audits a securities firm, they have these things called pre-interviews and post-interviews. And in the pre-interview, you get to tell the SEC what it is about your firm that's unique, and things that they ought to look for. Uh, you, you get a chance to humanize, if that's the right word, the process. And so in my pre-interview, um, I, I said to this young man, a few things, but the, the crux of what we talked about was I said, so let me understand the audit process. What you do, as I understand it, is you take the trade water, that's every trade that we've done for some period of time, and you check it against the trade tickets to make sure that the trades that we said occurred, occurred, and make sure that they occurred in the way that we said they occurred. And then you call 10 or 15 of those, you call the counterparties to make sure that our record was correct and that it happened the way that we documented it. Yes, he says. And then on the other hand, you take the check register, money in and out. Did we pay for what we bought? Did the customer pay for what we sold him? This kind of thing. I mean, really the function is you have this trade water. This is a record of your activity. You have the evidence of the initiation of the activity, and you have evidence of the settlement of the activity. And we, he went to defend the SEC about all the other kind of things they do. You know, this rule, that rule, like no broker in the cage, all this kind of idiotic stuff. He says, I said, come up, tie down. I mean, the essence of the audit is this, right? Yes, he says. He said, so listen, I'm not an auditor, okay? I'm not trained in this kind of thing. I'm not trained in enforcement. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not an accountant. But from what I've read, Bernie Madoff in 18 years never made a trade, and he stole $14 billion. I reckon I could have busted him if I would have looked at his blotter and his non-existent trade tickets and called the non-existent counterparties and looked at the non-existent check register. So how did Madoff get through nine audits and not get busted? Where was the protection? Sir, he says, we've been wondering that ourselves. <laughs> so let's think about what the Swindlers, and the Swindlers Encouragement Committee does. Did it protect anybody from Enron? Any volunteers? How about Madoff? What happens is that uh, firms that are stationary, firms that are well capitalized, firms that do a lot of business, put up with systematic harassment. All these prosecutors want to be like Centerfold in Securities Magazine for busting some guy like me. It's difficult to get the ne'er-do-wells, the will-o'-wisps, the intelligence swindlers. The SEC doesn't get hold of them anywhere near in time because they're not set up to. They're a bureaucracy that exists for the furtherance of bureaucracy. The tragic part of this is that there are millions and millions and millions of investors out there who feel either that they are or that they ought to be protected by the SEC. And I'm not picking on the SEC. Okay, maybe I am a little bit. But I'm not picking on the SEC to the exclusion of these other alphabet agencies. I'm simply pointing them out because I understand them so well. Um, I deal with them so often. I would suggest to you that uh, if somebody, if I knew better the Environmental Protection Agency or the Department of Defense or some other humanistically uh, 
organized instrument of the federal government, say the Internal Revenue Service, um, if you examined them in detail, you would find um, that they don't protect you, but unfortunately, perhaps with the exception of the IRS, there's this sort of aura of protection surrounding them that accomplishes specifically the opposite of what their promise is. The SEC doesn't protect people, it causes them to lower their guard. And that's extremely dangerous. The other thing about politics that I think you need to understand, and this is more as investors, um, is the context, the, the concept of political risk. Uh, and this is a little subtler. When we assess political risk as speculators or investors, we often feel rather than think. If you look at places that we regard as politically risky, what comes to mind? Somalia, Congo, Sri Lanka, uh, now that Bolivia has gone to that uh, coca lord, you know, Bolivia, places like that. And we think that places that function according to the rule of law, parliamentary democracies, uh, people, places that speak English that we're culturally familiar with, are somehow politically less risky. Uh, I would suggest to you uh, that they are politically very risky. In my experience in extractive industries, I've had my wealth stolen from me in British Columbia, right here. I've had my wealth stolen from me in Alberta. I've had vast amounts stolen from me in the People's Republic of California. But the price of the opportunity was higher in those places because of the perception of a lack of political risk. There seems to be a perception on the part of investors that money that is stolen from you by people who aren't white, not in English, and not according to the rule of law, is somehow money that is more gone than money that is stolen from you by pernicious regulation uh, or confiscation in some other places. Bonnie and Doug will remember back in the 80s, we were responsible for financing the discovery of a gold mine in California called the Castle Mountain Mine. A wonderful mine. Unfortunately, it was located seven miles on the wrong side of the state line. If the, if the mine had been eight miles east, it would have been in Nevada, and we would have had a pass. But unfortunately, um, whoever's responsible for mineral deposition uh, put it on the wrong side of the line. We discovered it in California. And it, this was a lovely, lovely, lovely gold deposit. And most of it was on private land, not federal land, so one would say that they had no nexus at all. <laughs> not the case. From the time we had the feasibility study finished to the time we were able to put the mine in production was 12 years. Um, what happens to cash flow at an 8% discount or 10% discount over 12 years? It disappears. I mean, if money, if, if cash flow is denied for 12 years at 10% discount, the net present value of that cash flow, damn near zero. It doesn't mean that 12 years from now you won't be happy to have it, by the way, uh, but it's damn near zero. So we had about $300 million stolen from us, and we spent $16 million in bribes for the privilege. I don't mean efficient bribes, like in the Congo. You know, where it's direct drive, you pay for service. Uh, my old friend Adolf Lundin famously said, the honest politician is the one who stays bribed. Um, I'm talking about deeds in lieu, campaign contributions, all these kind of things. $16 million, do you know? I mean, this is, this is truly crazy. And I hate, to, I hate to belabor this, but it's, it's interesting in, in some sense. Uh, there was going to be a 600-acre impacted area with this mine. And uh, there's a little creature that lives out there sometimes called a desert tortoise. Anybody know what they are? Cute little things, shaped sort of like a Volkswagen Beetle. And so we had to, uh, we had to hire a couple tortoiseologists. Um, they were actually called herpetologists. Very nice people, by the way. Like the, like the SEC people. I really like these people. And they hiked all over Hell's Half Acre, and they couldn't find any turtles. And they came back and reported that there were no observable turtles. But that didn't matter to the legislature. Uh, the legislature said, well, obviously, these tortoises were in burrows. I'm not making this next part up. So we had to fabricate these motorized skateboards with cameras on them and send them down into these burrows to disturb the rats and snakes and stuff that were That didn't work. They turned over and stuff like that, but we had to make the effort. And the herpetologist made the report that there were no observable subterranean turtles either. <laughs> then it came back, well, just because there were no turtles there now, 
there might be turtles there in the future. And our great big haul trucks would run over them and make them into turtle burger. And so we had to mitigate the turtle burger threat. And the nature of the mitigation was that we had to build a turtle fence around 600 acres of the impacted mine site. The turtle fence is five feet high, about this tall. I don't know what you guys know about these turtles, but they don't climb very well. <laughs> they jump less well. And they don't fly for shit. <laughs> there was, by the way, no requirement that we bury any of the fence. And these things do burrow rather well. <laughs> I was going to draw this to their attention, but I was cautioned not to do it. <laughs> Another uh, interesting part of this, and then I'll move on to something actually relevant, but this just amuses audiences no end. Um, it turned out that you know, there were some old mine shafts on the property. And in the mine shafts, there were these things called Mexican mine bats. Mexican mine bats didn't live in California, that part of California, be be uh, before mining, because there weren't any caves. We made these mine shafts, and so we made bat habitat. And so we had three shafts that had Mexican mine bats, because there hadn't been enough mining in California. These mine bats were an endangered species, never mind that they were an invasive pest from Mexico. So we, <laughs> right, wetbacks, uh, we had to evacuate these poor bats. I don't know if you've ever tried to catch a bat, but it's no easy test. So what we had to do is put, not we, the batologists, had to, um, had to put these mist nets down in these holes and they'd put all these bat traps in them and clap their hands, scare the shit out of the bats. And the bats would fly around, get caught in the bat nets, and then they'd take them away to some other mine shaft. You know, scare these poor little things to death. And they get them 17 miles away to this other shaft. And at night, of course, the bats came home. And so we went through the cycle a couple times until the batologist said, you know, what you're doing is very stressful with the bats. And he said, would you please tell your boss, you know, to, <laughs> would you please get us an order to make us cease and desist? Um, and eventually that happened. And the final thing that was interesting is, as a consequence of getting our permit, we, de we dedicated a big ranch there, most of it BLM uh, grazing land. We deeded it to the Nature Conservancy. Um, <laughs> we were required by the, de by the BLM to deed this land to the Nature Conservancy, one part of the BLM, the part that deals with mining. And then we were subject to an action from the BLM because we took the cattle off the range that we had deeded. And taking the cattle off the range, obviated our deeded use of the land. So we were prohibited from taking the cattle off, and we were required to take the cattle off by the same agency. And we had to threaten to counterclaim against the agency before this foolishness ended. Um, and there's a suggestion to me in this case that California doesn't operate or isn't a theater where I'm exposed to political risk. This is truly insane, uh, truly insane. By contrast, uh, we got involved uh, in 1996 in a much safer jurisdiction, the Congo. Uh, it was a war that two million people died, none of us, fortunately. Uh, but the fact is that Congo had no chance to get ahead in the world without mining. One of the things you learn about politics, by the way, or sovereign political risk, is that a society that can't get any worse, doesn't. And a society that can't get much better, doesn't. And when we got in Congo, they had no alternative but to uh, affect economic advancement through mining. That isn't to say that there weren't some rent seekers who probably got paid rent. Um, and I'm not defending um, a lack of transparency in, attract in extractive industries. I'm simply saying that the type of bribes that they may have been paid were much more efficient and much more honest than the bribes that were paid in California, certainly more efficient. Uh, from 1990, we began the process in 1996. In 2001, we were in production. So you take a place that has no government, except competing warlords, I guess sort of like us, um, that is a war that has malaria, that has Ebola, that has 19 linguistic groups that have a historical antipathy to each other, that allegedly exists for the purpose of plunder. And from my point of view, the political risk that I experienced in the Congo was less than the political experience, risk I experienced in California. So in the context of defending yourself from your own perceptions, remember that the basic point of political organization anywhere in the world is redistribution or theft. And what's important isn't the complexion of the thief, 
It isn't whether your money is stolen from you in English according to the rule of law. It's simply how much politics impacts on the activity that you're engaging in and what is your opportunity cost? What is the perception of risk? And how is the asset valued in the context of the risk that you're going to face? Very, very, very important in investing. Dealing with the risks of collectivism. Doug Casey taught me this one, too. Since externalities as a consequence of collective activity is a given, I mean, railing against it is fun, and doing something about it is nice, but these risks are inevitable, so you may as well use them. Market volatility. Um, the United States government is engaged in this thing called quantitative easing. You and I might more accurately describe it as counterfeiting. That's what it is. There is a suggestion in Washington that they are buying these bonds to introduce liquidity into the system. This is hogwash. They're buying these bonds because nobody else will. That's why they're buying them. It's fraud. It's counterfeiting. They're debasing the currency. And yes, by all means, rail against it. But also understand it's happening. Protect yourself against it. Try and figure out a way to profit from it. Somebody's going to. For sure, I'm going to. I mean, I might not succeed, but for sure, I'm going to try. It's important that you understand that currency debasement is occurring. It's important that you take whatever measures you think are appropriate to protect your, yourself against this. Does this involve shipping your money to some other country? Does it involve buying another currency? Perhaps. My own suspicion is that you run the same risks other places. I enjoy saying the US dollar is the worst currency in the world, except perhaps all the others. Um, does it involve buying gold or silver? Um, probably. Um, it's important that you think through the threat, and instead of merely protesting against it, do something to protect yourself, or better yet, profit from it. It's my belief as a consequence of all these governments around the world engaged in competitive devaluation, competitive competition, competitive regulation, that we're going to experience incredible volatility in the market. When you're dealing with volatility, when volatility is inevitable, it's important that you as economic beings understand what volatility is. And one thing it is, among other things, is the opportunity to buy low and sell high with increasing frequency. If you think about volatility as a series of 30 or 40 percent off sales, it doesn't sound so bad. Now, of course, most investors look at volatility and they become afraid by it. They become victims of the market as opposed to beneficiaries of the market. If you look at your stock statement and your account has gone from a million dollars to $700,000, you think it's bad. Not much happened to the value of those stocks, probably, if it fell fast. What happened is that the price changed. What's important that you recognize in terms of dealing with volatility, whether that volatility was put in the market by the government or some other thing, is simply that assets that are on sale cheaper are better than assets that go on sale that are more expensive. Since it's going to happen anyway, it's up to you to think in terms of how you deal with it. Um, once again, deferring to Doug, this is getting painful, but um, Doug taught us that um, bear markets don't make assets, they don't make assets go away, they don't reduce wealth, they just return wealth to its rightful owners. The wise. Uh, the fact is that if a house goes in price from $500,000 to $200,000, the house didn't change. It's the same house, the same lot, the same roof. I mean, maybe it wasn't maintained for a couple of years because somebody walked from it. The fact is, though, the value of the house, the utility of the house didn't change much, but much, but the price changed a lot. It's interesting in the context of the so-called real estate collapse that all the hue and cry in Washington and Sacramento and all these places now is a decline in house prices where in 2006, the hue and cry was about a lack of affordable housing. Well, the market worked. We have lots of affordable housing now. We're just sad that it's our own and it's become, <laughs> it's become affordable. And the simple nature of this is that since it's all going to happen, you need to defend yourself. You need to, um, and it's tough to do, you need to, say, you need to defend yourself against sanctioned fraud because that's what they're seeing. These bailouts that people have talked about before, this is insane. Anybody in this room think that their life was greatly, greatly, greatly negatively impacted because Lehman Brothers went broke? What would have happened if Bank of America went broke? Any idea? How about Merrill Lynch? 
I'm tempted to think that this was for the greater good, frankly. Um, the nature of these markets, the nature of these sins, is when something is really, really, really wrong, it needs to be righted, and nothing got righted. One of the great benefits of the local market here in Vancouver, the penny stock market, is that once every five or six years you have price discovery. This market is mostly worthless. 10% of the companies carry all the value. 90% of the companies are valueless. And maybe once a decade, this market falls 95% in price. That's very good. You have price discovery. All these companies that are worth nothing go to their intrinsic value, which is nothing. And if we let that happen in the broader market, if people understood that they had to defend themselves in the context of these markets, rather than being defended by the Swindlers Encouragement Committee, the people responsible for Mr. Madoff's success and Enron's success, uh, the less need for protection that there would be. So what I'd like to leave you with is the thought that um, the biggest risk you face is your response to risk. The biggest investment risk that you have is to the left of your right ear and the right of, the right of your left ear. That your defense is your responsibility and that the best defense is a good offense. Take a look at these risks, wherever they come from, however you perceive them, and think about how you can benefit from them rather than being victimized by them. Thank you. Well, good. I wasn't as long-winded as I normally am. Um, I'm open to take questions, assuming there are any, or comments. Sir? Um, you live in Canada and you're an American, so you might be able to answer this question. If the U.S. comes down to the Mala fascist police state, given that Canada has such close economic ties to the U.S. and a huge shared border, what are they, what's the likelihood that Canada would go the same way? Whether or not those in power in Canada really want that to happen? The gentleman asks, um, Will Canada follow the United States in the road to ruin, voluntarily or involuntarily? I would suggest to you that until 15 years ago, Canada was ahead of the United States in the road to ruin. In the early 90s, you ran the wheels off the ship of state, which was good. You slowed the rate of government growth, and because nobody would lend you money, um, it wasn't through wisdom, by the way, through the fact that nobody would lend you money, you didn't become as heavily indebted as we were. The United States is an extremely competitive society. And we realized that Canada was ahead of us on the road to ruin. We mobilized and pulled ahead. <laughs> and what's happened in Canada, you guys need help with a lot of things. What happened in Canada is that accidentally, the price of oil and raw materials went up. And now as a consequence of social rents, that is theft from the province of Alberta, the country's in relatively good shape. Um, you have the Norwegian disease or the Dutch disease. Um, this is an extremely capable, extremely competent, extremely well-educated society. And I expect that over the years ahead, the race to the bottom will be once again hotly contested between the United States and Canada. And I don't think that it'll be the United States that pulls Canada down the road to ruin. Um, Self-determination is part of the Canadian culture. And I think you guys will be much more competitive on the road to ruin than you have been in the immediate past. Sir? Great. Um, you still live in California, and after those yeah. I'm curious about that. I'm also curious about your perspective on flight outside of the U.S. Yes. Yeah, um, that's a tough question. Uh, here I am describing risks and um, response to risk. I'm deliberately putting myself in harm's way. Culturally, uh, I'm American in some senses. That doesn't mean that culturally I wanted to go to Vietnam. But there's some aspect of uh, American that I am. And culturally, I'm Californian. I remember years ago being with my wife in Venice Beach uh, watching that totally chaotic scene, Satan is wonderful, I mean, this is great, you know, pretty girls in string bikinis um, roller skating down Venice Boulevard, I mean, there's a lot to like. <laughs> uh, also, um, both my wife and I have aging parents who live in California, and I have a business in California. Um, our uh, escape plan uh, involves, first of all, an escape from the People's Republic, which we think is probable, after I fulfilled my obligation to Sprott, who bought us to preside over the build-out of Sprout in the United States for three years. Uh, my hope is that I have the opportunity to, in the first instance, work less hard uh, and protect myself from my own avaricious instincts, uh, but also uh, move to a state that doesn't have state income or capital gains tax. In terms of moving beyond that and moving outside the United States, um, 
I think my own plans are best kept as my own plans. I don't want to exacerbate my risks by being too public with you. Can you comment on the principle of it? Oh, the principle of it is uh, it, you can't dispute it. I mean, my, my own actions are, um, in some senses, idiotic. Uh, but they, ref they reflect the fact that I'm old and fat and rich and comfortable. And uh, uh, <laughs> my, my friends David and Reagan, you know, consistently try and point out um, the moral uh, imperative I have to deny the People's Republic and the evil empire the incredible amount of their bombs that I buy. And it, I mean, it's it's absolutely inexcusable what I do. Absolutely inexcusable. I started off by saying, you know, by quoting Pogo, uh, I have met the enemy and he is me. I see him in the mirror. Other questions? Sir? But, um, in terms of those of us who are perhaps more mobile, I think in the UK, thinking about moving on, what nations or places do you think are a good place to look at that have a good business environment and do not have the government to fix? With the caveat that my tax and legal advice are worth what I charge for them, which is nothing. Uh, I would start by suggesting that you figure out where you'd like to live, uh, because it isn't all about avoiding tax. And then I would think about structuring your life in a way that, irrespective of where you live, you minimize the impact of the exchequer on your bank account. Um, I don't know enough about you to tell you how to do that. And if I did, uh, as they say up here, my best ideas seem to be indictable offenses. <laughs> so I would seek very good counsel, uh, but there's an old maxim in libertarian financial planning that says you should attempt to have your ass, your assets, and your passport segregated by jurisdiction so that no one commons has access to all of them, and that's about the best thing I can say. You know, one of, one of the things is in terms of where you put your person, if you've protected your assets, is that putting your person somewhere doesn't necessarily expose your assets to risk. And there's, I think, a lot of sense in having your assets uh, in some place else than where you are. I would also encourage those of you who are Americans, uh, and I'm not going to make a moral statement here, I'm going to make a practical statement, to do whatever you do in terms of expropriating your assets absolutely according to the law. Uh, we make a lot of jokes about inefficient government. The U.S. government is a lot of things, but they're not inefficient. And when you talk about threats to your liberty, I mean, if you think they're hard on terrorists, you're going to see what they do to tax evaders. Uh, they will put you in the slammer. So be very, very, very careful if you're American in terms of how you expatriate your assets and do it absolutely, positively, legally. That helps. Other questions? Yes, one more. The lady asks if you have a U.S. and Canadian passport, which is favorable. Um, I don't know over time, as I say, the United States, I think, has pulled ahead on the road to ruin. Uh, but Canada is also a well-educated country. Um, there is a um, tax and privacy attorney here in Vancouver who I could refer you to who would probably be much better able to answer that question than I. I've been, I've been primarily occupied with people helping people build their wealth. I'm I've been less occupied with understanding how to protect it. Sir, color? Yeah, to add to your horror file of absurdities and government regulation that grows out of your gold mining problems, I was reminded of the um, of the litigation that surrounded the efforts to store uh, nuclear waste at the Yucca Mountain in Nevada. <clears throat> and a federal judge required a showing of what the ecological and environmental consequences on that study would be for the next one million years. <laughs> now, do you think that that's a long period of time that the human beings have even been on the planet, probably? Um, that there have been, I think, 10 major ice ages uh, in the last 100 years. All of the problems associated with plant plant tectonics and hurricanes and earthquakes and everything else. The idea that you could anticipate, that you could predict the consequences for a years must surely entertain anyone interested in chaos theory. Absolutely. No, I mean, it's, uh, you know, I, no comment necessary. <coughs> okay. Yes? Market. 
the gentleman uh, pointed out that I made a reference to Warren Buffett as a free market thinker, and I think he was wondering if I was tongue in cheek. Yes, yeah, uh, you know Buffett's. Uh, He's an amazing guy. He's truly a spectacular investor, and he's a wonderful, wonderful writer. And uh, he's a thug. Um, he's, a, he's a particularly intelligent thug, though. He continually describes everybody's obligation to pay taxes. If you're a student of annual reports, and I am nothing if not that, um, what you learn is that Mr. Buffett's business is conducted as a reinsurance business. And that's very important. Mr. Buffett takes on long-tailed liabilities and reinsurance. And since he doesn't pay out dividends, he's allowed to price his policy loss reserves at any amount he wants to. So he increases his policy loss reserves, and he doesn't report profits in his insurance business. So he doesn't pay tax in Berkshire Hathaway. The tax liability from the subsidiaries flows up to the parent. The parent swells their policy loss reserves. And he has $70 billion in, quote, float in Berkshire Hathaway. Float is policies received before claims against it. So Mr. Buffett believes in taxes, provided you pay them. Uh, this is enlightened from one point of view, and I would probably do it if I could. Uh, but I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't describe him as a great social thinker. I would describe him as a pragmatic thief. <clears throat> great franchise. I'm not saying not to buy the stock, by the way. Reagan? Which of the 1% is he in? Both? Oh, many. Many, yeah. I mean, remember that you can, as Doug would suggest, you can be part of many files and you can be part of many disciplines. I think as a social thinker, he is probably fifth standard deviation in terms of destructiveness. Although he does say in his annual report that any social organization including a business that's built on any principle other than self-interest is due to fail. Uh, I wish he would read his own stuff. It's very, very good. <laughs> Have I worn you out? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Well, let's meet at 2.50 uh, after coffee for the last session. Thank you.